Uh, even though um, I had the, about the 1,800 interviews over the past year and a half since my book appeared, this is the first time that my last name was pronounced correctly. Hey. And uh, <laughs> I credit that to the 50% of my DNA that is German, uh, my father's side. And my father left uh, Germany uh, when he was 11 years old. So I, I didn't speak much German. Otherwise, I would be glad to, to give this talk in German. Um, and in fact, uh, my father did not witness uh, the Second World War. So we heard a lot of music uh, from Strauss and so forth. And uh, I'm I'm very proud. I mean, my family lived for 700 years in, in Germany. So thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to join you. Um, and let me uh, share my screen so that uh, you can see my slides. And uh, as briefly mentioned, in fact, we could have saved some time if you would introduce me um, as a farm boy, because I grew up on a farm um, uh, in Israel. And, um, and that pretty much shaped my career. And uh, one thing you would notice is, even though many of my colleagues uh, had an issue with uh, uh, my uh, uh, recent uh, um, research, uh, simply because uh, it violated what uh, you know they they believed in in the past. Um, you know, the scientific method is about collecting evidence. It's not about human impressions, human beliefs. We learned that from history, and therefore uh, I established the Galileo project, and uh, we're trying to collect evidence. And it's not about us; it's about what. Uh, is surrounding us, the reality that we all share. And the only way to learn about reality is not to listen to what people say, not to pay attention to how many likes you get on Twitter. That's a virtual reality. Um, anyway, my book, uh, the cover of my book is uh, in the middle of this slide. Uh, uh, it was called Extraterrestrial, translated to 25 languages. And if I had to uh, summarize it in one sentence, I would say, uh, when you're not ready to find exceptional things, you would never discover them. And um, I should tell you that since my book appeared, um, uh, there was a huge amount of uh, attention internationally. In fact, the first time my uh, uh, literary agent approached me uh, to write a book, I declined. I said, I, I would like to, pref uh, to focus on my scientific research, but she insisted and eventually I agreed. And it was uh, uh, in a way uh, sending out a message internationally because uh, a month ago uh, I, um, uh, I attended a forum, a public forum where an Iranian uh, born entrepreneur approached me and asked me, could I have a selfie with you? And then she posted it on Instagram and she told me the following morning that I have hundreds of followers, uh, women scientists in Iran following me. And uh, just two days ago, I had uh, a young woman from Israel that came to my home and asked to join the Galileo project. Apparently, it looks as if the appeal uh, of this subject is uh, international. I mean, it doesn't adhere to national borders. And actually, if you saw the image of the Earth um, from the Orion spacecraft, uh, there was no evidence for the border between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, Earth appears as a blue marble and from, from space. And even though that perspective is not really uh, attended to uh, on the front page of newspapers these days, because they focus on the border between Ukraine and Russia, that is the correct perspective from uh, a, a universal point of view from the universe. Uh, anyway, so this is my book in the middle, and on the right you see the textbook uh, Life in the Cosmos that I wrote also last year, uh, about a thousand pages long. And what you see on the left is a, a photograph of a picture that was hung on the walls of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science and Humanities, and it was taken by the German photographer Herlinde Quilbel uh, in an exhibition that she had. And she came to my office a few years ago and asked me, to write on the palm of my hand the question that I regard as most important in science. And I wrote, are we alone? And here I don't mean <laughs> um, the, the question that is often asked on dating apps. Uh, what I mean is a question that humanity should ask. 
Uh, and in fact, this question appears to be of interest uh, also uh, to people engaged in spirituality. I got uh, uh, an email a couple of months ago from a rabbi who told me that she gave a, a sermon, uh, a, a word of Torah for the Jewish high holidays about my book. Um, and that was uh, uplifting as far as I'm concerned. But what's interesting is that the frontiers of science uh, overlap with uh, spirituality because both of them uh, engage in exploring the unknown. Uh, here is a photo, um, a group photo of the Galileo project team uh, that was taken at the beginning of August when we held the first in-person conference of the Galileo project at Harvard University. By now we have about a hundred members of the team and there are uh, close to a thousand volunteers that would like to engage as well. It's such a great privilege and pleasure to see 70 members of the Galileo Project team coming together, celebrating the past year accomplishments of the project. And uh, we are just at the beginning uh, because in the coming year, we hope to collect data and find out what it shows. Uh, we, we make no assumptions. We are completely agnostic, but it seems like the government is telling us that there are some exciting objects out there that we need to figure out what they are. And that's our hope. For now, we assembled the relevant instruments, we are testing them, and we will soon deploy them and start collecting data. Because the sky is not classified, and we very much hope to discover what the nature of objects that the government is talking about, and that astronomers are talking about, that look like outliers are. Are they technological in origin from another planet, or are they natural phenomena? And the Galileo project aims to find out along three tracks. One is looking at unidentified aerospace phenomena in the sky and uh, imaging them in the infrared, optical, radio, and audio bands. The second is rendezvousing with interstellar objects in space and taking a close look at them. It will cost about a billion dollars to meet an interstellar object. Uh, there is a much cheaper way of doing that, and that is to find an interstellar meteor. We know of one that landed near Papua New Guinea uh, in 2014, and we plan to search for the fragments from this meteor by scooping the ocean floor. And that is the third branch of the Galileo project. So we have very exciting times ahead and we look forward to what we will find. <laughs> so yeah, I'm Ezra. Um, had a great time on this project so far. Uh, it's been uh, it's been great working with the team that we've had, you know, come to the rooftop hitting your thumb with a hammer, sweating all day, lifting heavy objects, um, and, and just, you know, working with with several of the teammates that have been here for, uh, you know, up on the rooftop with me for, for a few weeks or, you know, a couple months now. It's been, uh, it's been an honor to work with them and, and meet these people. I'm excited for what the future holds. This is just, you know, a preview of, of what's to come. Um, you know, getting a, a first look at our instrumentation, getting our hands on it, you know, it's working and we're getting data. And um, now, now is, you know, what I consider really the start of things where, you know, we get to, to put in some really nice sensors and expand our reach and set up different, set up at different locations. And um, yeah, that's where the, the real exciting parts, you know, come together and uh, really looking forward to this next year.
so one is indeed the going after unidentified aerial phenomena. Another one, uh, as you will hear, is uh, rendezvousing with uh, an object uh, that uh, is out there uh, in between the Earth and the Sun. And the third would be uh, going after the uh, remnants of uh, meteors that came from outside the solar system. I'll discuss all of them. Now, what did the scientific method uh, teach us so far? We know that uh, a substantial fraction of all the sun-like stars, somewhere between 3% and 100%, uh, there is a large uncertainty still, um, have uh, an Earth-sized planet roughly at the same separation. So what we find in our backyard is common. Uh, and um, it means that the dice of intelligence was rolled billions of times within the Milky Way galaxy alone. And there are more habitable Earths in the observable volume of the universe than there are grains of sand on all beaches on Earth. So that brings a sense of cosmic modesty. We should be humble uh, because, you know, we are not that special. The circumstances that led to our existence are not that special. And of course, that goes against what we want to believe. Uh, so if you look at the images of emperors or kings uh, who conquer a small piece of land here on Earth, and the latest incarnation of that is uh, Vladimir Putin trying to conquer a small piece of land, uh, that is not different from a, an ant hugging a single grain of sand on the landscape of a huge beach. That's not very impressive. But I can understand where it's coming from because when I watched my daughters, uh, these are my two daughters when they were very young, uh, they thought that the world centers on them. And of course, uh, that changed when uh, we brought them to the kindergarten. On the first day, they had a psychological shock to realize that they are not necessarily the smartest kids on the block. Uh, and of course, our civilization will mature when we meet others. So right now, we have not met others. And so, you know, we prefer to believe that we are the smartest. But Albert Einstein was not necessarily the smartest scientist who ever lived since the Big Bang. 13.8 billion years ago. This is a cartoon uh, made uh, on the day that Einstein died. Um, and uh, it shows the earth with a plaque on it. Albert Einstein lived here. And as much as we are proud of Albert Einstein, it's very likely that there were scientists on other planets that were smarter than Einstein. Uh, because most stars formed 5 billion years before the sun. And and so those civilizations who benefited from those other scientists um, could have launched probes that would have reached us by now. And recently, last week, I was on a Zoom call with a former executive in SpaceX that works with Elon Musk. And I told him that Elon Musk is not the probably not the best uh, rocket builder who ever, ever lived on the, uh, over the past 13.8 uh, billion years. And therefore, we should search for rockets that were sent from other planets in our vicinity. Uh, and, and that simply results from the um, realization. I mean, we look at the universe, we see how stars were made as a function of cosmic time billion years ago. And the sun was made 4.6 billion years ago. The stars like the sun formed 5 billion years before the sun. Uh, the sun is a late bloomer. And therefore, you know, there could have been civilizations before us. And they had plenty of time because if you use chemical rockets of the type that we launched so far, that Elon Musk launches now, uh, you know, at th those speeds, you can traverse the entire Milky Way galaxy in half a billion years. So definitely they had enough time to reach us, even with chemical propulsion, the type that we are using. And across the galaxy, the time it takes light to uh, move is, is of all the tens of thousands of years. So if you send a probe, uh, it makes no sense uh, for the probe to wait for guidance from the senders, it has to be autonomous. 
So we can imagine providing artificial intelligence to a system that goes into space on a long journey so that it will be independent and will learn from uh, machine learning, the, the type that computers can learn uh, from you know, the conditions that it faces and then adapt to those independently, autonomously. And I call these AI astronauts. So it makes more sense to send autonomous systems and perhaps those populate all habitable regions in the Milky Way galaxy. Now, this is not a philosophical question. We can find out by looking through our telescopes. It's not very complicated. But instead, what people do is argue what they think the reality is like instead of looking out. And my point is we should not repeat the mistake made by philosophers uh, four centuries ago, who knew that the sun moves around the earth. And if you were to ask them to design a mission that will reach Mars, they would never get to their destination because they thought that Mars moves around the earth. And that's wrong. So reality is whatever it is, irrespective of what people say or think. Today, Galileo would have been canceled on social media. He was put in house arrest at the time when he argued that perhaps the Earth moves around the sun. Now, what do we know about objects that came into the solar system from outside? The first report was from a telescope in Hawaii uh, called PanStars, which was tasked to find all the near Earth objects that it can, can identify. And that's because we know the dinosaurs were killed 66 million years ago by a rock of the, of the size of Manhattan Island, and uh, we don't want the same fate. And even though the dinosaurs were much bigger than us, uh, we are much smarter than they were because we look up and we can build telescopes. So the idea is to look out and have a warning of any object that could collide with the Earth. And the, the US Congress tasked NASA to find 90% of all the objects larger than a football field, about 140 meters. Um, 90%. So NASA uh, constructed uh, the PanStars uh, telescope in Hawaii. Uh, the US government funded it and it surveys the sky. We know that within the next century, there is no object bigger than a football field that will collide with the Earth. But we are not yet done in uh, surveying the sky. We only know about half of those uh, objects that are above a kilometer that may come close to Earth. Um, so uh, this object looked around and uh, this telescope looks, looked around and found this object, Oumuamua, that came close to Earth, but was moving too fast to be bound to the sun. So it was obviously from outside the solar system. It couldn't be bound to the sun because it's just too fast. And it gave it the name Oumuamua, which means a scout in the Hawaiian language. By the way, if it didn't come close to Earth, it would never be flagged. But it turns out this was not really the first object discovered from outside the solar system. Uh, there was a previous one, and we identified it with my student, Amir Siraj, in a government catalog of meteors. This one was half a meter in size, and it collided with the Earth on January 8th, 2014. It, it basically burned up in the Earth's atmosphere and created a fireball that uh, government uh, satellites identified. Obviously, the US government has sensors looking at the sky because they are worried about ballistic missiles. And every now and then they see a fireball from a rock that came and collided with the Earth. Okay, so they just uh, declassify those events and release it to the public. So I asked my student, why don't we check the fastest moving meteors and see if any of them is unbound to the sun? And we discovered this one. So we wrote a scientific paper and then uh, the paper was rejected. Uh, and the reason it was rejected is because the reviewers said, we don't believe the US government. Now, I had no doubt that the US government uh, has accurate data because they need to know whether a ballistic missile will hit Boston or New York City. 
okay it's a matter it's an existential risk for people living in those cities um, however, the referees said, no, we think that the U.S. government has uh, flaky data. We can't really trust it. Okay, so I tried to reach out. I was the chair of the board on physics and astronomy of the National Academies, and I reached out to some people uh, beyond the national security fence. And uh, it resulted in March 2022, this year, in a letter that you see on the left sent to NASA from the Department of Defense, uh, the US Space Command. So basically the Department of Defense came to my defense in this case. Uh, and this letter said explicitly that they confirmed that this object, this meteor came from outside the solar system at the 99.999% confidence. And at that point, after this letter came out, our paper was accepted for publication. So by now it's published in the Astrophysical Journal. It's really strange that the US government is more open-minded than my colleagues. And we can talk about why. Because after all, academia is supposed to be blue sky open-minded, right? And the US government is supposed to be the most conservative organization. Anyway, uh, as a result of that, we are planning an expedition. Uh, now, the government also released the light curve from the fireball, from the explosion. And from that, we inferred that since the object disintegrated only 19 kilometers above the ocean surface, in fact, it was the lower Earth atmosphere, and it was moving really fast at 45 kilometers per second. As a result, we can tell that the material strength of the object was tougher than iron. It was tougher than all the space rocks, 272 of them, in the same catalog. So what is this object? Is it an iron meteorite? In which case it would be five, less than 5% of all the space rocks that we ever found made of iron? Or is it even tougher than that and it's made of an artificial alloy? In other words, it's a spacecraft. Uh, and uh, recently, we just had uh, a paper just uh, uh, two days ago, uh, a paper that with my students that calculates the size distribution uh, of the fragments that resulted from the explosion, depending on whether it was iron made or made of stainless steel, for example. Uh, you can see that on the right side. Basically, we get fragments up to the size of uh, tens of grams, basically. And, and that means that we can go and search for them at the bottom of the uh, Pacific Ocean. And it turns out we just a few months ago, we had a paper where we found a second meteor uh, in the same catalog. This time, the paper was accepted for publication yesterday. So uh, it looks like we are slightly shifting uh, what the mainstream allows us to publish um, on this subject. So we have two interstellar meteors. This one came, uh, was identified in the same catalog in March 2017. So uh, also appears to be tougher than all the other space rocks, 270 of them uh, in the catalog. Uh, and so it looks like the interstellar meteors are of a different origin than solar system rocks. And the question is, what are they? They could be natural, but then it's completely different natural origin. My name is Avi Loeb, professor of science at Harvard University. In the coming months, I'm going to lead an expedition to Papua New Guinea to scoop the ocean floor and search for fragments from the first interstellar meteor. Although Avi is in search of what he believes may be alien technology, proof of extraterrestrial existence has never been what's driven his life's work, until now. I'm hopeful we will find something. The question is, what is it? An unusual rock, a natural object, or artificial? Despite being the longest serving chair of Harvard University's Department of Astronomy, it wasn't until recently that he started to investigate the possibility that there is life beyond our solar system. 
I found a catalog that the government compiled of meteors that were detected by government sensors uh, that are missile warning system. I asked my student to check if any of the meteors, the fastest moving meteors, could have arrived to Earth from outside the solar system. There was one in particular that sparked the interest of Loeb and his student, Amir Siraj. We decided to write a paper about this meteor, which was discovered on January 8th, 2014. Light from the explosion was seen by government sensors. Despite the government releasing limited data, he had discovered something groundbreaking. His paper laid out what he believed to be true. But three years after writing his findings, a major development confirmed what he knew all along. After a few years, the release of a letter from the U.S. Space Command in the Department of Defense stating explicitly that this meteor at the 99.999% confidence level came from outside the solar system. Based on the speed of the meteor and how much of the object burned upon entry, Avi determined that it must be made of a material that is tougher than iron. And so this one was an outlier in terms of its composition. It was also an outlier in terms of its speed outside the solar system. It moved at least twice as fast as stars move relative to the sun in the vicinity of the sun. Armed with new evidence validating his findings, Avi decided to take action and make moves to recover the object his next hurdle. Funding through private donations, he has secured a portion of the money to take the trip. Let's continue to look for objects like it. It was obvious to us that we need to go there and collect the fragments because to do the same thing for an object in space would cost more than a billion dollars. For a cost that is a thousand times lower, we can go to the ocean floor and collect material from an interstellar object. Now, Avi has the task of finding an object that most likely fractured on impact, leaving fragments possibly the size of pennies lost at the bottom of the ocean. It's a challenge that might seem insurmountable in the vast existence of the Pacific Ocean. But Avi is confident they will recover what they are in search of. It's a fishing expedition, literally speaking, and what we can do is basically take the trajectory of this meteor and extrapolate it all the way to the ocean surface. Now, of course, when the explosion took place, there were fragments generated and they were scattered over a region. One imagines that the tiny pellets would be carried farther away from the point of impact, whereas the heavier fragments will sink down closer to the impact. Finding a big chunk can inform us much more about the structure of the original object. We're planning to board the ship and build a sled and a magnet attached to it that will scoop the ocean floor and we will go back and forth like mowing the lawns across the region 10 kilometers in size and collect with a magnet all the fragments that are attracted to it and then brush them off and study their composition in the laboratory. This will be the first time that humans put their hands on the material that makes an object that came from another star. With more advanced technology in our skies than in any other point in history, new findings are becoming far more frequent and impossible to ignore. Oh my gosh, dude. Wow. Thanks to a government report that was released last year, the possibility of extraterrestrial life and the pursuit of proof of its existence is finally losing its stigma. The stigma has been reduced. It would be the most important scientific discovery that humanity ever made, because if you think about it, it will change our perspective about our place in the universe. With science in his corner, this professor is not intimidated by critics. It's not a philosophical question whether we live in an environment where objects are floating around that are representing extraterrestrial technologies. We just need to use our telescopes and find out. In fact, we are not even the first to say that. Galileo Galilei said that four centuries ago, and he was put in house arrest. Today, he would have been canceled on social media. Once I realized that we found an object from a technological origin that was produced elsewhere, I would not seek approval from anyone else. I don't need likes on Twitter. I just want to know what it is. Okay, so uh, based on that, we are planning an expedition, hopefully within uh, four months or so. 
Uh, the explosion took off uh, near Papua New Guinea, about 100 miles from there, and released a few percent of the energy of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. So it was quite a dramatic event. Uh, but we know where to search, and uh, we are currently in the process of organizing it. I received full funding at $1.5 million for the expedition uh, from a, a wealthy individual that had a Zoom meeting with me and said, no problem, you have the money. Um, so um, we will see what we find. Uh, and uh, I promised uh, the curator of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City that if we find any gadget, uh, that is of extraterrestrial origin, I will bring it for display because for us, it represents modernity. For the senders, it's ancient history. Now, let me go back to Oumuamua, which was the subject of my book. Um, this object was at first thought to be a rock from another planetary system, but then it was also quite unusual. Uh, because, uh, first of all, it came from uh, a frame of reference that is uh, rare, uh, and that is called the local standard of rest. It's the frame that you get to when you average over the random motions of all the stars in the vicinity of the sun. And this object was at rest in that frame. Only one in 500 stars is so much at rest as Oumuamua was, and sort of like a buoy sitting at rest on the surface of the ocean, and then the solar system collided with it like a giant ship. And the sun gave it a kick by its force of gravity. So um, as the object was tumbling every eight hours, um, the amount of sunlight that was reflected from it changed by a factor of 10. That's quite extreme. It means that the object had an unusual shape because the area projected on the sky that the object displayed changed by a factor of 10 as it was tumbling. And the best fit to the variation of light was that of a disc-like object, the pancake-shaped object, at the 90% confidence. And in addition, there was a force pushing it away from the sun. Uh, and in addition to the force of gravity, which is attractive, Usually such a force can come from cometary evaporation when an object, the ice on the surface of a rock evaporates by warming uh, as a result of the illumination by sunlight. Um, the, that gives the rocket effect uh, a push on the object, just like a jet uh, uh, propels an airplane or, or a rocket, uh, except that in this case, there was no cometary tail. There was no evidence for gas. In fact, the Spitzer Space Telescope uh, looked very deeply around this object. Uh, and you can see the image in the top right. It's just noise. There was no evidence for any um, carbon-based molecules or dust around the object. The repulsive force declined inversely with distance squared. And that led me to suggest maybe it's just the reflection of sunlight that is pushing the object. But for that to be effective, the object had to be very thin, sort of like a sail, a flat sail. And nature doesn't make such things. So I suggested maybe it's artificial in origin. The paper, this paper was accepted within a few days for publication, but then there was a huge pushback from the astronomy community saying, no, 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 we should not even discuss the possibility that it's artificial. And at first there was a review paper in Nature Astronomy magazine that is quite prestigious. And in the review paper, all the experts on space rocks basically said, it is natural, period. Forget about it, let's move on. And then a few months later, a team of astronomers said, okay, well, but we have to explain the anomalies. Okay, so let's continue to argue that it's natural, but we need to give some explanation. Why was it pushed away from the sun? So they said, okay, well, maybe it's just a fluffy object, a porous object, uh, an aggregate of dust particles that are very loosely bound, a hundred times less dense than air. And so it's so lightweight that the reflection of sunlight is pushing it like a feather. 
The only problem is that an object that is 100 times less dense than air, when it gets close to the sun, will get heated to hundreds of degrees and will not maintain its integrity. So then another group said, OK, we have another explanation. Maybe it's a chunk of frozen uh, hydrogen. Because when hydrogen evaporates, it's transparent. We cannot see it. So it's still a comet, but made of a gas that we cannot see, hydrogen. The problem with that is that hydrogen evaporates very quickly. So we showed in a paper that such an object would not survive the journey through interstellar space for millions of years. And the authors of this proposal agreed with us. So then another group came uh, out with uh, a different explanation a few months later. And by the way, all these explanations were after the review paper said it's a natural object, period. Let's forget about it. Let's move on. I mean, if that was the case, why would all these groups come up with additional papers? It takes a long, uh, it takes months to write such a paper. Why would they put the effort if it was obviously natural? Why would three groups put an effort to explain it? Anyway, so then the third group said, well, it's a nitrogen iceberg chipped off the surface of Pluto-like planets. And then we showed in a paper that there is not enough solid nitrogen on the surfaces of all the Plutos uh, in the Milky Way galaxy to account for large enough population of chunks of nitrogen uh, such that it would explain Oumuamua. The bottom line of this story is all of these suggestions, explanations, uh, invoked something that we've never seen before. We've never seen a cloud of dust particles. We've never seen a hydrogen iceberg. We don't know if nature makes hydrogen icebergs the size of a football field. We've never seen anyone. The only place to do that would be in a molecular cloud. But we've we don't know whether solid hydrogen is made in molecular clouds. And so when this proposal was made, everyone in the scientific in the, uh, in the astronomy community cheered up and said, yeah, that's the explanation. But we don't know if such a thing exists. And then the same is true about nitrogen icebergs. The fundamental question is whether Oumuamua was natural or artificial in origin. And the way I view it is when you walk on the beach, most of the time you see rocks or seashells that were naturally produced. But every now and then you see a plastic bottle that implies a civilization exists not far away. So perhaps Oumuamua was a plastic bottle. Now, it turns out three years later, the same telescope in Hawaii, Pan Stars, discovered another object that shared the same qualities as Oumuamua. It was pushed away from the sun by reflecting sunlight, and it didn't have a cometary tail. And a few weeks later, the astronomers that discovered it with the same telescope, by a pan star, realized, oh, it's actually a rocket booster that was launched by NASA in 1966. And then they found that it's actually made of stainless steel. Obviously, there would not be a cometary tail if an object is made of steel. And um, it had thin walls. And as a result, it was pushed away by reflecting sunlight. So we know that this object 2020 SO, that's the name it was given, is artificial because we made it. The question is, who made Oumuamua? And of course, if you imagine cave dwellers uh, that are used to playing with rocks, when they find a cell phone, they would argue that the cell phone is a rock of a type that they've never seen before. Until they start pushing buttons on it. And then they would realize that it records their voice, it can take their image. I would love to press a button on a rock of a type that we've never seen before. Now, um, 
winery uh, in uh, Santa Cruz produced a, a brand of wine inspired by the discovery of Oumuamua. It's called Cove Oumuamua. And we used it at the banquet of the conference of the Galileo Project uh, in August. And actually, the winemaker decided to have a press release about it. Um, and here is another public uh, um, statement. Daily Double. You are well in the lead at 4,400. How much would you like to wager? Let's do 2,000, please. Here's your clue. I look at the world and I notice it's turning, thanks to this man who studied at the University of Krakow in the 1490s. Who is Brahe? No, correct response, who is Nicholas Copernicus? You lose a little bit, pick again, Robin. Scientists for 600. We think of this Russian who became a professor of general chemistry in 1867 periodically. Robin. Who is Mendeleev? Yes. Scientists for 800. Avi Loeb thinks a space object seen in 2017 and artistically depicted here comes from this 16-letter type of being, the title of his book. Kevin. What is extraterrestrial? Correct. Uh, scientists for 1,000. Okay, so um, by the way, this was Jeopardy for those who are not familiar with the American culture. Uh, it's quite a popular uh, program on television. Uh, and so a year ago, I also received uh, an email from another rabbi um, who gave a sermon about extraterrestrial and uh, for the Jewish high holidays. And uh, one of my colleagues said, next time we meet for dinner, my wife and I will ask you to give a sermon. Uh, my response to that was, I would never give lead a, a congregation whose members uh, agree with me. So it looks like there is a new frontier in astronomy because we discovered the first interstellar objects over the past decade. Once again, it's not a philosophical discussion. We are talking about real objects, the first ones that came from outside the solar system that we learned about over the past decade. It was not available to us before the last decade. And the first three of them, the two interstellar meteors, and Oumuamua appear to be unfamiliar. They look unusual. They appear to be outliers. And what's the chance that the first objects would look so unusual? Now, Enrico Fermi, the famous physicist, asked, where is everybody? Back in 1950, he was in Los Alamos chatting with colleagues about extraterrestrials. He said, well, it may be that they existed, but where is everybody? That's just like sitting at home and saying, where are my neighbors? But to find your neighbors, you need to look through your windows and you better use a telescope. And that's the spirit of the Galileo project. Now, separate from the astronomy uh, data that I mentioned, uh, the, the US government is talking about objects that they cannot fully understand. Of course, it may be a mixed bag. Some of them may belong to the Chinese uh, for espionage. Uh, some of them may be natural objects. Some may not be real, but it's sufficient to have one object that came from outside of this earth that is of technological origin for this to change the future of humanity. So my point is, let's just collect good data so that we can tell if all the objects are familiar. So the coming years will be exciting and uh, it will be uh, the Galileo project will uh, engage in collecting the data. In fact, as of last week, we are starting to collect data and I'll describe the instruments we're using. Now, when we look for objects, it's very different than what was done before. For 70 years, uh, scientists were engaged in looking for radio signals, but that's just like sitting at home and waiting for a phone call. There is a completely different method. Instead of waiting for a phone call, you can go out and check your mailbox, whether any packages arrive to it. Check the mailbox 
is very different than waiting at home for a phone call. Trade one method by the other. You can have no phone call whatsoever, but a lot of packages that accumulated over a long time in your mailbox, and the senders may be dead by now. So looking for interstellar objects is very different. And usually for radio signals, one is using the Drake equation uh, called after Frank Drake, who passed away uh, in September this year. Uh, here, it's very different than the Drake equation. All you care about is how many objects per unit volume accumulated over time in our neighborhood. You multiply that by the volume of your survey, and you will know how many objects you will find. That's it. And if you are looking for objects that collide with Earth, you can think of the Earth as a fishing net um, that collects fish. And that depends also on the speed of the objects. And of course, these quantities depend on the size of the object. But most importantly, there is an extra factor, which I call the ostrich factor, which is the likelihood that we will behave like an ostrich. Because if we don't look, we will never find anything. And before the last decade, we didn't really look. So we didn't find anything. Now we have the instruments that allow us to, to search. Um, of course, on the surface of Mars, we have a robot called the Perseverance rover. And you know, if we find microbes uh, that existed in early Mars, uh, that is no threat to our ego. Human intelligence is far superior relative to these microbes. Everyone will be very happy about finding microbes. We are still the most important creatures in our neighborhood. But imagine a situation where the same Perseverance rover will bump into the wreckage of a spaceship on the surface of Mars that represents technologies far more superior than we are using. That would be a blow to our ego. A lot of people would get upset by that. Now, a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, in my case, it's worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book. I would much rather have a photo album of Oumuamua than write my book. I would just show the pictures and say what it is and be done with it instead of writing 66,000 words. And you can see a picture of a, a, an asteroid called Bennu on the right-hand side that was taken by the OSIRIS-REx mission that NASA launched that landed on this piece of rock. You can see that it's a rock. You know, and if we landed on Oumuamua, we could tell whether it's a hydrogen iceberg, a nitrogen iceberg, or if it was a dust bunny, we would just pass through it because it would not have a hard surface. So it would be obvious what it is. That's all we need. It's not a matter of debate. It's just a question of good data. And so the Galileo project is planning the details of a space mission to rendezvous with the next Oumuamua so that we can get enough data on it now that we are aware that such unusual objects exist. And we have a dating app for the young people in the audience, the older people may not recognize what I talk about, but, um, and the dating app is uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile that will start operations next year. It will be equipped with a camera that has 3.2 billion pixels. That's a thousand times more than the number of pixels you have in your cell phones. 3.2 billion pixels surveying the southern sky every four days. So that telescope will find more objects like Oumuamua. And I think of it as a dating app 
because if we identify an object far enough, we can then send a space mission that would rendezvous with it, that will meet it along its path as it approaches us. And most of the time we will swipe to the left. We will disregard objects because such a mission costs a billion dollars. It's very expensive. That's a very expensive date. So we will be quite selective as to which object we want to date. And by now we have also the Webb telescope that is uh, one and a half million kilometers away from Earth. Uh, it sort of provides us with another vantage point. We can look at an object from two different directions, from the Earth and from the Webb telescope. It's sort of like having two eyes. If you ever wondered why we have two eyes, the reason is simple. The animals that had one eye were eaten up because they couldn't figure out the distance to the threat. If a tiger would approach them to eat them, they would not recognize the distance of the tiger. With two eyes, you can tell the distance of an object because you observe it from two different directions. That's called parallax. And the Webb telescope gives us the second eye and that would allow us to figure out the trajectory of an object like Oumuamua very precisely so that we can tell if it has propulsion in addition to the force of gravity from the sun that acts on it. Now, perhaps Oumuamua was flat and thin because it was a, a letter carrying a message for our salvation. Uh, or maybe it was just a surface layer from a bigger spacecraft that was torn apart. We don't know what its origin, what its intent was. But one thing I wanted to emphasize is when I go to Harvard Yard, I often find monuments, uh, statues or paintings of people that thought highly of themselves and wanted to preserve their physical appearance. And the only problem is that within a billion years, the sun will burn up the surface of the earth. So nothing will be left of these statues in the long run. And also they are relatively primitive, they are static, they don't change. Uh, a much better approach is to make a monument in space of yourself in the form of an AI astronaut that carries your blueprint uh, and can adapt to changing circumstances and can outlast the sun, could survive for billions of years. So my favorite monument would be an AI astronaut. Now, it's quite embarrassing that the... Um, when we sent the New Horizons, which is a mission that will eventually exit the solar system, uh, we sent it first to Pluto and there was a box attached to the spacecraft that included 30 grams of the ashes of the scientist who discovered Pluto named Clyde Tambau. You see him on the left. Now, the ashes of Clyde Tambau are no different than the ashes of a cigarette. They carry no information whatsoever about Clyde Tambau. So if an extraterrestrial finds this box, they would warn, wonder, why do humans have this primitive ritual of burning the genetic information of a person that they want to commemorate? That makes no sense whatsoever. I actually asked the principal investigator of this mission, I said, why didn't you put a stem cell of Clyde Tambau or an electronic version of his DNA so that an extraterrestrial could reconstruct Clyde Tambau? And he said, that would have been a bureaucratic nightmare in NASA if I were to do that. Once again, showing that as a civilization, we are not that intelligent. So my proposal was actually, let's send another spacecraft that would overtake New Horizons and apologize for this box. 
Now, as I mentioned earlier, the US government uh, uh, is discussing those objects that are not identified. There was supposed to be a report a month ago. Uh, it's still classified. We haven't yet heard what uh, is in it. And there is a new um, branch of government looking into all the data, uh, a new office. And also NASA announced a study on unidentified objects that will recommend to NASA whether to invest funds in the, in the research. But the Galileo project is already doing this research. And uh, if I had to provide a motto for the project, I would say extraordinary conservatism leads to extraordinary ignorance. Um, and so what we did so far is build the, a suite of instruments that monitor the sky in the infrared, in the optical, in the radio, and in audio, and takes a movie of the sky at all times. And what we want is to distinguish between human-made objects like drones, airplanes, satellites, and natural objects like birds, insects, uh, and then see if there is anything else out of this Earth. Uh, and um, at first, we tested the instruments on the roof of the Harvard College Observatory a few months ago. And now we place them at a favorite location. They are already collecting data. And we will make copies of them in spring 2023, three copies that we will put in different locations. Um, finally, I wanted to make a comment about dark matter. The, we don't know what most of the matter in the universe is. At first, we thought that the matter in the universe is the same as in the solar system. Turns out, no. 84% of the matter in the universe is a different substance. We don't know what it is, despite a century of looking for evidence. My colleagues very often uh, quote Carl Sagan, who said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And my point is that extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. And the example is the dark matter. Uh, we don't know what it is. And then $10 billion were invested in the Large Hadron Collider to look for one natural explanation for the dark matter, which is the lightest supersymmetric particle. Supersymmetry was conceived as a new symmetry of matter. And everyone said for decades, yeah, we know where the parameters should be of supersymmetry. We will find it with a Large Hadron Collider. We did the experiment, $10 billion. We didn't find it. Now, I'm not saying that's not the way science should be done. It, obviously, you know, the only way to find out is to build the experiment. But nobody said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence in this case. We put the money forward and we looked for the evidence. So it turns out that if you invest just 1% uh, of this amount, let's say $100 million, in the objective of the Galileo project, we can make a lot of progress. We can identify the unidentified. And finding if there is technological equipment from other civilizations in our vicinity would have far more um, far, far reaching consequences for the future of humanity, much more than knowing that the dark matter is the lightest supersymmetric particle. So, so I find it surprising that the mainstream of scientific research is not engaged in, in this subject, given that the public cares so much about it. Of course, we can look for uh, indirect signatures, such as industrial pollution in the atmospheres of other planets or city lights on the night side of other planets. And I wrote papers about it. Uh, there is a tension between the ability of a technological civilization to venture into space and its ability to destroy itself through nuclear wars or, or climate change. And so the question is, how many probes were sent by other civilizations? And you know, most of the probes could have been sent just before their star died. There must have been a huge exodus 
uh, from those planets when they realize that they're about to die. Uh, that may be most of the probes that we find in interstellar space. And the answer to Fermi's paradox is, it's possible that most of them are dead by now, most of these cultures that existed in the past, but we can look for evidence, uh, any relics they left behind. And these could take the form of uh, space trash, objects that are not functional, or AI astronauts, functional objects. And uh, my hope is uh, that by um, finding a relic of uh, a, an advanced civilization, it will inspire us. Now, we have no protocol for engaging with such an object. Uh, there is no organization that represents humanity uh, because we've never imagined that we will have a visitor in our backyard to which we will need to respond immediately. But as I said, I hope that finding such a relic that tells us that there is a smarter kid on our block will inspire us. Because if you look at human history, uh, most of the evil in human history was triggered by a group of people trying to feel superior relative to other people. That's the source of all evil. Some people trying to feel superior relative to other people. And if all of us realize that there is a much more superior intelligence out there, perhaps we will be convinced that we are equal members of the human species. And the basic message that we get from the universe is have a sense of modesty because the cosmic play started 13.8 billion years ago at the Big Bang. We just, you, the human species just came over the past 3 million years. It's a small fraction of cosmic history. We just came at the end. And since the days of Galileo and Copernicus, we know that we are not at the center of the stage. The earth moves around the sun. The sun moves around the center of the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is one out of a trillion galaxies expanding away from each other in the universe. So if you are not at the center of the stage and you arrive to the stage at the end of the play, the play is not about you. And the only way to find what the play is about is to seek other actors who have been around for longer than you had been. That's my message. Thank you. And I'll be glad to take any, uh, any questions.